Hello, I'm Richard Heathen, and this is Liberty Machine News on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Tonight, I will cover the crisis at the U.S. border, and I will feature an interview I did last week with Tim Moen, the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada, where we discussed his campaign in the recent Fort McMurray by-election and strategies for promoting liberty. Our top story tonight is the collapse of the U.S. border, the crisis of the U.S. border. For those who aren't familiar with this story, over 57,000 unaccompanied children have been picked up by the United States Border Patrol since October 1st, 2013. Now, Obama is asking Congress for $3.7 billion in emergency funding to deal with the unexpected surge in illegal traffic or traffic at the border. And it's interesting because they are using, they already are letting people, letting these people in, uh, aren't doing anything. They're housing some of them, in, some of these kids. Uh, some of them, some like families and such who are being let in are being actually being bussed in to given bus tickets and traveling to wherever they would like within the United States. Uh, the United Nations is pushing for many of the Central, Ameri- uh, Central Americans fleeing to the United States to be treated as refugees displaced by armed conflict, a designation meant to increase pressure on the United States and Mexico to accept ten- these tens of thousands of people currently ineligible for asylum, according to the National Post. U.S. border officials are standing down. These people are being allowed into the U.S., and well, I'm, not, I'm not for sending them back, but it, these are just facts. Uh, 1% of these, these minors coming on the border, only 1% of them have been deported, uh, that which is down for 2% the previous year. I think we're talking 2013 and 2012. The problem is, this is going to create an even greater incentive for poor immigrants to send their children to the U.S. I'm sorry, but with the socialist system, the social assistance that these illegal immigrants have, these displaced people have, they're going to put an ever-increasing strain on the socialist system there and I just can't see this being great like I deeply sympathize with these people and if there was a stateless society I would say all for them you know they should be allowed in but the problem is they have a oppressive socialist system which is taking money from other people and is giving it to illegal immigrants and you know Immigrants, not just immigrants, but anyone who's kind of poor, and this is just this is going to put increased strain on the economy. This is just not good. According to Breitbart.com, the illegal immigrants who cross as an incomplete family simply enter the U.S. illegally, turn themselves in to the U.S. Border Patrol, and are processed and then released with the notice to with the notice to appear at a free at a future court date. U.S. taxpayers then fund bus tickets for the illegal immigrants to go to any city in the United States of their choosing. Approximately 95% of the illegal immigrants never return as promised to their court proceedings, according to Hector Garza, a Border Patrol agent and spokesman for the National Border Patrol Council, the Border Patrol Union. Again, this has been reported by Breitbart.com. Again, I'm not making a judgment on these people. You know, I I feel for them. I I think mobility is a basic human right. 
Uh, people need to be able to travel as they see fit. I'd love to go see the world. There's so many uh, beautiful, wonderful places in the world that, you know, it's so hard to travel because of these ridiculous state lines. So I'm not, I am not judging these people, and I'm not saying these should be sent back. I'm just pointing out facts. And the fact is, this is a socialist, the United States is very socialist with uh, regards to their welfare state, and this is going to put an even greater strain on it, which, I'm sorry, but a lot of these people, they these unwashed masses, they have no concept of liberty. They just know they want to, you know, they want something. They, they, they want something better. And uh, the predominant culture for a lot of people who are Hispanic or illegals is they vote Democrat. You know, they, they think it's in their best interest to vote for the Democrats, which are the basically left-wing party. If you look at the voting patterns of most people who are, you know, illegal or immigrants, they vote Democrat, and that's just not going to be good because these people are going to, you know, they're going to ask for more stuff, more free stuff. Because put it this way, once you get a taste of free stuff, it's hard not to, like, want more. So they're going to get the taste of it, and they're going to want more, and this is going to be a strain on the U.S. economy because you're going to have more and more people demanding free stuff. This is going to cause friction between the haves and the have-nots, the you know, <clears throat> the people who are still able to hold on to some sort of productive employment, and the people who just don't understand economics, don't understand the way society should be organized, is organized, the way the just basic laws of economics, and they're going to just want more and more and more. And I just see this as a this is going to this is going to exasperate the decline of the American Empire, and probably. Because the United UN is putting pressure on the U.S. government, and you know there's pressure not just from the UN but everywhere. This is going to kind of accelerate the integration of United States, Canada, and Mexico. Like I said, the whole thing is probably going to collapse. And look at what's happening. And what ha what's going to happen when it does collapse? Let's look at what's happening in Detroit. You know, a lot of anarchists were thinking, "Oh yeah, Detroit, Detroit's collapsing. We can." step in and move in there. Well, everyone, instead of moving there, everyone's moving to New Hampshire, which is fine, you know, I think all more power to you. But what's happening in Detroit? We covered this last week. They are turning to the UN, asking them to supply them with water. Now, what do you think is going to happen on a mass scale when the US state collapses? They're going to seek foreign assistance from whoever can give it to them. And I imagine the UN will try and step in and form some sort of partnership with the U.S. government to kind of facilitate services. The U.N. is, I've covered previously, as a far, far left-wing, I would say economically and cultural Marxist attitude, uh, attitudes and agenda. So it doesn't take much imagination to see what's going to happen. What I think is going to happen is as more and more illegal immigrants from Honduras and other countries come into the United States, it's going to accelerate the collapse of the economy because in order to get these people to keep voting for them, the Democrats are going to keep promising them more and more and more stuff. And as that happens, that will accelerate the decline of the United States. And as, General Petra as I covered General Petraeus last week, it will facilitate the rise of North America, which I don't think is good for Canada because on our side of the imaginary line, you know, the economy is fairly good, at least where I'm at in Alberta. It's sh it's b really bad in Ontario. It's shaky in BC, but, you know, I think we're doing pretty good up here. The last thing we need is, an I don't know, an influx of people who are going to be voting and wanting an expansion of the state. If these people were free market libertarians, if they wanted liberty... I'd say all four, let's bring them in. But I don't think that's what they're going to be asking for. And like I said, this will be used as it, as the United States collapses, the United States empire collapses, this will be used to create a North American super state, an impetus. Like it will, the borders will become less and less meaningful and there will be closer integration with all three governments. But let's look at the cause of this influx. What is the cause of this 
influx of immigration. These people just didn't come out of nowhere. Most of the most of these immigrants are Central Americans who are traveling through the Mex through Mexico to reach the United States. The largest number of them come from Honduras. In 2009, there was a military coup that deposed the democratically elected Honduran president and instituted a different regime. I think it was a military coup. Central America Central America's northern triangle of Guatemala, El, Salv El Salvador, and Honduras has become one of the most violent regions on earth in recent years with swaths of all three countries under the control of drug cartels, drug traffickers, street gangs. These people rob and extort the ordinary citizens with impunity with no form of retribution or justice. There's no nothing else there. And this is according again to the National Post. According to Insights, an organization that documents criminality and corruption on the ground in, uh, in Central America, specifically in Honduras. Uh, in Honduras, there is a series of powerful local groups connected to political and economic elites who manage most of the underworld activities in the country. They have deeply penetrated the Honduran police which police force, which is one of the most corrupt and mistrusted police forces in all of Latin America. Despite this, though, the U.S. government is supporting and funding the Honduran police. Uh, according to the White House's own website, in Honduras, under the Central American Regional Security Initiative, we will provide $18.5 million to support community policing policing and law enforcement efforts to confront gangs and other sources of crime. Well, they're empowering one of the major sources of crime in Honduras. According to the Con Congressional Research Service, approximately 25 million flowed to Honduran security forces in 2013. Other U.S. funds support Honduran forces through USAID and the Inter-American Development Bank. <clears throat> In May 2012, a 15-year-old Ebed Yanes was returning home by motorcycle when he was murdered by the Honduran military. Soldiers pursued him in a F-350 truck donated by the U.S. government to a checkpoint staffed by U.S. trained and vetted and equipped soldiers. So let's think about this. It is a crisis that the United States is supporting that is creating this, th these displaced people. You know, uh, I have all the compassion for them in the world. I don't know what to do with it. The whole system's screwed. Maybe we should. Maybe they should be let into the United States so they can crash the whole thing, and and we can take it from there. Because everything's bad now. But we're we're get, the United States is funding the crisis that's that's creating this, uh, supposedly to fight drug cartels. But it's been abundantly covered that the United States works with certain co cartels to work against other cartels. They've uh, m major newspapers have covered in the past the fact, the very fact that the United States government has has laundered drug money through banks. For the major cartels, of course, they say, "Oh, this is just doing this just to, uh, f to track it or whatever." But it's it's absolute nonsense. The U.S. government was, has been caught numerous times smuggling drugs. As early as as recent as 2007, there was a CIA plane that crashed with like three tons of cocaine in it. Before that, in the 90s, they were caught smuggling drugs. They were caught smuggling drugs in the 70s. The whole thing is just an utter, utter joke. So one would have to almost wonder if, if some portion of this 
is intentional. They have to understand that their the U.S. government, their work is causing this, what they're doing with the drug cartels. You know, there was a scandal with the BCCI bank where it was a bank out of the U.K. where they were busted laundering money for the drug cartels, lending, uh, laundering money for intelligence services. It's a it's an open secret that the cartels and the the CIA and all these other intelligence groups work together. They sell the drugs. I'll tell you the the purpose of the drug war is artificially artificially inflate the price of drugs, so U.S. secret services and intelligence agencies can import drugs, sell them, make a big profit, so they don't have to document their covert activities. Now. To kind of wrap this up, this is a problem caused by statism. This is a problem caused by the government. You know, in a free market society, these people would be happy to live there because they live in a beautiful, you know, Central America, beautiful, beautiful part of the world. You know, I would love to live somewhere where in the tropical, with a tropical vibe, with tropical weather and just places beautiful. It's only through the paradigm and the crimes of the U.S. government that these people are forced to move. All right, moving on. I recently interviewed Tim Moen, the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada, and we discussed a wide range of topics, including his recent campaign and uh, basically his thoughts on reflections on it. We talked about his vision for the liberty movement going forward. Uh, I will play you some excerpts of that interview, and if you're interested in seeing the whole interview, you can come over to my YouTube channel or visit me on libertymachinenews.com. Uh, but my YouTube channel is death metal, youtube.com slash deathmetalpatriot. All right, I will leave you with my interview with Tim Moen. Uh, this is Liberty Machine News on the Voluntary Virtues Network. All right, I'm Richard Heathen, and this is Liberty Machine News, and I am once again joined by the now leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada, Tim Moen. Hey, Tim, uh, thanks for coming on. It's been a long time since, I mean, a lot has happened, I should say, since the last time I talked to you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me on, Richard. Uh, yeah, lots, lots has happened. <laughs> You are now the official leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada, and I don't think they could have picked a better candidate if they tried. Uh, congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it is a, uh, it's an honor to, to be um, chosen as leader of the party, but it's also a pretty, uh, pretty big responsibility. I don't take it lightly. You know, it's uh, like I've said to other people, um, in this uh, cause of liberty, lives are at stake. This this isn't uh, something to be taken lightly. No, it isn't. Uh, you recently were part of the by-election up in Fort McMurray. For those who might not remember, we did a I did a bit of a money bomb to try and support your efforts. And uh, why don't you talk about that experience? Uh, what was that like for you? Uh, you know, I'm still trying to digest it. It's, uh, it's still, it's actually not even quite over for me. I still have to get some paperwork in and finish off a few things and close off the thing. Um, uh, it's, it's been just kind of a blur of activity. And, uh, you know, the one thing is that you never have enough time to do everything you want. There's, uh, you never have enough time or money or help. So, it, it always feels like you're behind, like you're never going to uh, accomplish the things that you want in the campaign. But, uh, but I'm told that that's how, that's how campaigns are, like that everyone experiences the same thing. Um, so that was one thing I noticed. Uh, it, I mean, it was good. I, I definitely connected with a lot more people than, than I have doing any other type of activism. A lot of people asking questions. Uh, parts of it, I wanted to blow my brains out because people are stupid and uh, they project all their crap onto you. And they, you know, like I was at one thing as a big pro-union rally and one, 
and people are just standing up saying, these are our jobs, these are our jobs, you need to give us the jobs first. And I just, I, you know, it was all I could do not to vomit listening to, it, there, there was a number of things going on. I mean, uh, on one hand, uh, just, just the ridiculous amount of dependence these people have on government, that government has all the answers for them and that they're projecting this shit onto me as their potential government representative, mm -hmm. as if I somehow am their daddy now and have yeah. the answers for them and ought to be able to give them what they want. Wow, we need jobs. And uh, it was all I could do to, to, to suppress vomiting and yelling at these people and just like calling it quits right there wow so, fuck uh, you 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 get what you deserve i don't I, I think you ought to have a terrible government i think you ought you know yeah well you know that's frustrating because you're you're wow that's that must be frustrating because if, if if they've got to you like that you're very usually kind of centered calm guy that's why you know we kind of drafted you because you're i would say the ideal candidate and if the fact that it's getting to you, wow, I can't imagine being in that situation. Well, it, yeah, and it's, that's just it. It's, it's, um, you have to suppress that part of yourself and you have to try to connect with people. And, that, and that's the thing. Like it, it is, it's a frustrating, um, it, it's a hard road to hoe. Like it's not, it's not an easy thing to do because, you know, I had to keep reminding myself before I got up and spoke that, listen, I have to connect with these people. It's about connecting with hearts and minds. And uh, these people have a disease and I have the cure. And they're, they're, it's not their fault per se that they have the disease. It was inflicted on them since early childhood. And, uh, you know, as a liberty activist, my job isn't to club them over the head and tell them they're idiots and sheeple and you disgust me. <laughs> Uh, my job is to try to cure them. I'm their physician. And, uh, and so uh, that, you know, reminding myself of that and reframing it was kind of uh, helped me to connect with them a little bit more. And, you know, even in crowds like that, I, that which were obviously pro-union and there to support the NDP, uh, there are a lot of people that came up and said, hey, man, I respect you for showing up here. I know it couldn't have been easy. And uh, I'm going to look into this libertarian thing more. And uh, so, you know, it, it, it was definitely, it wasn't easy. It was, it's a difficult road to hold. But, you know, I think that's kind of how, how I know that, that it was probably the right thing to do. Uh, you know, I know it took a lot of flack from different liberty activists for even engaging in this uh, process. And so, uh, but, I mean, change is, is not going to be easy, right? This, we can't sit around circle jerking all the time and imagine that we're creating a free world by doing that. And so uh, I think it is important to get out there into enemy territory, so to speak, and, um, and do the work that's necessary. It's not easy work, but, but uh, you know, at the end of the campaign, I think I got something like 375 votes or something like that. And that to me is actually pretty a pretty impressive number, um, because those are you know I, I don't think anyone in this region had even heard of libertarian before this campaign. At least that's the sense I got. So to go from that to 375 people in this riding, uh, understanding what libertarian is enough to vote for me, uh, that that's a good start i think for this well, for you know this campaign in some ways put libertarianism on the map a bit in canada i mean i saw i've seen a number of articles just about libertarianism now in papers like the calgary herald and um and so people are starting to take notice of of us well, that's so good. i think so i think that's a good thing and i'm getting messages from people that want to be candidates and uh things like that so there's some excitement going generated uh, in the libertarian community, uh, I think going into the 2015 election. So I do think we have something to work with now. And so I'm really uh, looking forward to seeing what we can do 
in the 2015 election in terms of spreading the message, in terms of getting people on the map. You know, uh, we we want to, I want to really uh, uh, look at, at what kind of publicity uh, we can generate going into the 2015 election because that's ultimately what we got to do. We got to market it because, you know, the, the brand libertarian, you know, we're not mainstream by any stretch and uh, uh, becoming mainstream is going to be a challenge, but that, that's kind of what the goal needs to be if we're, you know. Well, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, especially, I said, here in Canada. So any else, uh, what else do you have to, would you have any ideas on how we can get that kind of uh, coverage, that kind of attention going forward into 2015? Uh, you know, I've just, I just uh, finished this campaign and uh, I was taking a few days off from, from thinking about it, but uh the, you know, there's been a couple of ideas. Like one of the ideas that that we're we'd like to start working on is is something similar to what Ron Paul did with his plan to restore America. Uh, is create a document, uh, you know, like plan to restore Canada that outlines how we can get Canada. How how would a libertarian government work? So what are the things that we would do? Because you know, typically what happens is, and one of the one of the downfalls or weaknesses, I think. Uh, we have maybe in the Libertarian Party is that we don't really have a plan moving forward. Our plan is just dissolve government, basically. Well, it, how exactly do we plan to do that, right? All we are is anti this, anti that, anti that. We don't really have a plan to, to move forward. Like, how do we get rid of universal health care, transition to private, system how do we you know transition all these things over to private hands um so what what i'd like to do is develop a kind of a comprehensive roadmap for how we might do that you know does it look like in you know in universal health care rather than just pulling the rug out from everyone and saying okay you're now all on your own let's wait for entrepreneurs to now fill this big giant vacuum void we have uh, and sorry about all the chaos we just created, but that's it's a necessary thing because government's bad, okay? Yeah. Rather than do that, you know, maybe we have something like an opt-out system where, okay, we. or another thing, actually, when I was in Japan, I met up with some liberty activists, and one of the guys there had a fantastic idea, which was uh, even if we could just do this, just figure out, just provide people when they get their tax return back, exactly how much line by line, item by line item they paid into different social programs how much did they pay into the military how much did they pay into health care how much did they pay into this how much did they pay into the parliament offices like every single thing that our taxpayer goes to make a line item thing on it so that people can see how much they're paying to each thing and then maybe a libertarian government does something real simple like do okay everyone gets a two percent tax rollback and you can take it out of whichever line item you want. Whatever you don't want to support, you can de defund your 2% from that particular item. And that sends a market signal then immediately into, okay, which, which things do Canadians just not value at all? Well, and you know, I think, you know, I think there is something to be said for that because I think a lot of people I talk to, they're, they're scared. The idea of markets and leaving everything to the market it genuinely scares them you know they they they're coming to, they're coming to it from a place of fear and instead of a place of kind of empowerment and you know a place where you and I are coming from maybe of economic understanding they're coming a, a place of of genuine fear so you know i think something like that would be good to show them how you could kind of move beyond the paradigm of statism into a more a free society, and if we're talking through government reform, it's going to have to be a, an incre the disillusion of the state is going to have to be incremental, or else you know uh, right. I don't I think that I don't see you know barring some sort of revolution or state collapse, I don't see how else it can be done except except incrementally. Yeah, well, I mean, I I, I look at it from my own personal experience with applying liberty in my own life. 